Thank you for the people that have done this before me, all the men that have done this before me and the example they set for me and the encouragement they gave me to study and to try to improve myself. Father, I thank you for the eldership of this church and everything that's good and honorable and decent here. And bless each family here and bless the ones that aren't here and be with those in South Texas right now that's having a lot of physical problems. They're going through a lot. Let's put your arms around them, Father, and help them. And help us tonight to be receptive to your word. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're at the end of the book of James, and before I get started, I want to tell you a couple of things, so if you see something strange up here, you'll know it. I taught school for 30 years. I taught elementary, and I taught middle school and high school. Never had a problem talking around teenagers or kids or young kids. Never had a problem. But when I stand in full of room full of adults, I get nervous. I'm like a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And I'll get nervous. So if I get nervous, please forgive me. But, and also, when I get nervous, I tend to speed up talking. So I'm going to do my best not to talk fast. In the book of James, we've talked about many things over the last few weeks. I consider James a book of ethics. He tells us to seek wisdom from God. He tells us not to show partiality. He tells us how we should control our tongue. He tells us so many things. But in these last few verses tonight is a culmination of all that. And I'm going to try to use a practical approach. I looked at this lesson four different times and I threw away three of them. So I've really had to struggle with some things here, but I want to look at it a practical approach with some scripture and I hope that it'll be beneficial to you. And I want to, I'm not going to read the whole thing at one time. I'm going to take this a little bit at a time. Chapter 5, verse 7 through 20 is what we'll be covering tonight. Let's look at verse 7 through 7 and 8 first. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the earlier and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Before I get into that, I just want to mention a couple of things historically. I'm not going to, be, I'm not going to stretch this out. But I always like to ask questions. Why? were they having to be patient? Why were they suffering? Well, number one, they were in the Roman Empire and they worshiped one God. The Romans worshiped many gods. Caligula in the 30s had persecuted Christians. The Emperor Claudius threw them out of Rome itself in the, in the AD 40s. He threw them out. Don't want any Jews here. Don't want anybody that love worships one God. So the Christians were gone out of there for a while. That's one thing they did. And now think about this. Just for a minute, put yourself in place. You have been raised Jewish all your life. And all of a sudden, you put that aside and you become a Christian. Your family members now that were raised Jewish, a lot of them have turned on you. But in direct context here, what James is talking about, and it was brought out last week, what they're talking about here is these people were being persecuted by the rich. Back in those days, they were paid a daily wage. They weren't getting a check every two weeks. They were paid in coin at the end of the day. And sometimes the rich people didn't pay them. Those people missed meals. Those people couldn't buy clothes. And missing a meal would be a big deal to me. And if you take a good look at me, and you don't have to stare, but if you take a good look at me, I hadn't missed very many meals. But if you miss a meal a couple of times, you kind of wonder where your paycheck comes from. You kind of get upset. And these people were suffering. And they said, you know, we're suffering. God, where are you? Come on back, Jesus. Come on, Christ. We need, to, we need some help. And James writes to them, and he tells them, just be patient. Remember the farmer. I think in the American standard it says the husbandman. And I like that version, but remember the farmer. 
You know, I know there's some of you that probably farms here, but I know a lot of you have gardens. You don't go out and plant your seed one day and expect to come out the next day and, and harvest it. And I know of at least a few people in here raise cattle. You don't go out and buy cattle one day and expect to sell it the next day and make a profit. It takes time to build up the meat. It takes time to raise the crops. It takes time. In Israel, at that time, and I guess it may be the same day, there are two basic rainy seasons in Israel, in April and November. And that's when they, they planted their crops, and that's the early rain in April and the latter rain, or excuse me, actually the early rain was in November and the latter rain was in April. But they harvest their crops. But James, in those three verses, leads up to verse 8, or the last statement, he says, Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is hand. You know, I thought about that little verse right there, the coming Lord. How as we as Christians be ready for the coming Lord? And this is a practical application. You may hear me hear me say that word several times tonight, so I hope it doesn't isn't too redundant for you. In Romans thirteen four, Paul tells us in getting ready. To come for the coming Lord, he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision of the flesh. In other words, put things aside of the world and look to godly things. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy soul. And then he later says, love, and Jesus added to that later, and he said, love your neighbor as yourself. You put God first. That's what he's talking about, getting ready for the coming of Christ. Getting ready for the second coming. The next thing I think is even more patient, in Galatians 6, 9, he says, Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So while we're waiting for the second coming of Christ, what do we do? We keep doing the things that we should be doing as Christians. We help the poor. We pray. We do the things in life that God wants us to and that he's taught us in this book. James is just reemphasizing what he said earlier about our tongue. Our parts. He said, don't do those things. He said, do the things that are godly. But there's three things that we've got to understand from a practical nature about the second coming, I believe. One, always be on watch. Always be on watch. We don't know when time's going to end. Christ could come right now. He could come tomorrow. He could come any time he wants to. Or, you know, it could end any time. But 1 Peter 4, 7 tells us the end of all things is at hand. Be serious and watchful in prayer. Have a prayerful nature in everything we do. That's the practicality of the second coming of Christ. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we're going to live our lives. We're going to rejoice and be, be rejoicing and be happy that we're Christians. And we're going to have a prayerful nature. And we're going to have a great attitude. We're not going to walk around with somber faces saying, oh, here comes the Lord. We're ready for it because we know we're blessed. And I think that's what James is telling people. You know, James and a lot of the apostles historically thought that the second coming was pretty quick, would come pretty quick. And I'm not saying they were right or wrong, but... Obviously, it hasn't. In our way of looking at time, it didn't come quick. But the point is, you know, you see these guys on the news always predicting the second coming. It's going to happen on this day or that day or this year. To me, I get a little upset about that. That's kind of irreverent in my opinion because they're trying to take the place of God. No one knows. Not even Jesus, I don't think, if I'm wrong. Darwin, correct me if I'm wrong on this. But... Jesus said himself, I don't even know. Only God knows when he's going to come again. Only God knows when this world's going to end. The second thing I want to tell you is it may be a long time, so don't despair. Don't get despaired when you're discouraged, when you're suffering, when you're patient and you're at your wit's end. Don't despair because everything is the same as at the creational world. It's still time, still marches on. And in 2 Peter 3.8, Peter tells us that a day can be like a thousand years to God. And one of the things I like about it, when he tells us to be patient and waiting on the second coming here, James is telling us, really, if you think about it, that shows God's mercy. The longer it is until he comes, the more work we can do to get people to become Christians. And that's why we're here. 
So his time factor, if it's a thousand years from now, he's given millions of people more time to become part of the family. And the last thing on the third part of that is prepare yourselves. Now, how do we prepare ourselves for the second coming of Christ? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, or 12 and 13 says, Love one another, and I'm just reading the last section, it's love one another, so you can be holy at Christ's return. I'll say that again, love one another so you can be holy. If we don't love each other, we can't be with God. You know, we, we're supposed to love each other. Doesn't mean nothing. Doesn't mean that's why we don't fuss at each other. Doesn't mean that we don't necessarily sometimes argue with each other. Or we disagree. That's a family. Family's going to do that. I want everybody to raise your hand if your family never had an argument. All you teenagers sitting here, if your brother or sister never bothered you, raise your hand. You see, we, we you know, that's just part of going. That's, that, there's nothing wrong with that because we grow. But I think that's what God says. He tells us to be watchful and be ready for Christ's return. But most of all, like I said, it just gives us time to do more work. Look at verse 9 for just a minute. It says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. In the American standard, it says, Do not murmur against each other. You know, when you're suffering, it's like an open wound. And when you're sad and you're miserable and bad things have happened to you and you see other people, good things have happened to you, you just, sometimes you just want to do this and just not do anything. It just, you, and sometimes people resent it. The thought comes in their mind, why does nothing bad ever happen to that person? Why am I the one that's always got to suffer? Why does that person always get the breaks? And that's kind of a bad attitude because you're passing judgment on someone. You know, I don't think, just as an example, I don't think Lazarus and the story of the rich man and Lazarus sit around going, I wonder why the rich man gets all the breaks. It doesn't tell you. But in the end, Lazarus is with Abraham and the rich man's in hell because he didn't care. But it's just an example. When someone, when you're suffering, and I'm talking about Christians here, when another Christian brother is having something great happen to them and you're suffering, the best thing you can do is rejoice with them. Is be happy with them. Because when your joy comes out and your joy is complete, even though you're suffering and you're miserable and your day is rotten, if you share an honest joy with somebody that has something good to happen to them, all of a sudden you're going to start being joyful. When you're grieving, when you're hurting, when you're suffering, and things in life are not going your way, you get around people and you start helping other people, your life changes. And that's what's practical about it. You don't sit in a room and you don't mope and you don't cry. You get out and you try to help other people, or you get out and you share that joy. And I think that's what Paul meant when he said, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I mean rejoice. Always joy, always joy, always joy. Be happy. You know, and, and it's hard. It's really, really hard to do that. But this story is about patience and suffering. And I don't know how much suffering you've done. I can't tell you, but I can tell you right now. And I'm going to get into verse 10. I'm going to take a few minutes in verse 10. I'm going to explain something to you here because... It's pretty tough for me. But I know there's people in here that have lost their wives or husbands. I know there's people in here that's lost grandkids. I know there's people in here that may have lost a brother or a sister or someone. We've all lost loved ones. And when that happens, it just feels like somebody took a scraper and scraped your heart. You never felt worse than you ever have. Sometimes when we get that away, we just feel so lonely. We can read the Bible and we're encouraged, but sometimes in our heart we just feel miserable. And that's the best way I can put it. And this next verse 10, I want to read you something. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about something. 
My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. We have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen in the end intended by the Lord that the Lord is merciful and compassionate. You know, when he mentions the prophets, think about all those guys that were persecuted. Elijah had to live in a cave because he was running from Jezebel. He had to go live in a cave. He was scared to death. Zechariah, who writes a prophecy in his book, if I'm not mistaken, I, if I'm wrong about this, somebody correct me later. Zechariah was killed. Look at the suffering of Isaiah. It doesn't mention it. Jeremiah was thrown in a pit in an old muddy well because he dared to prophesy against the king. It's all through the Old Testament. Prophet after prophet after prophet suffers because they dared to tell the truth and were honest. Even now, look at Jesus. I consider Jesus in many ways a prophet, even though he fulfilled prophecy, especially in Revelation. Look at his life, what he suffered, what he went through. Look at what all the apostles went through, and I don't know if you consider them prophets, but look at everything. If tradition is right, only one apostle died of old age. Every one of them was murdered or martyred. I went to Rome a few years ago on a trip, and I went through this museum, and it showed you know, all the apostles dying. And this is tradition. I don't know if this is true or not. But they showed Matthew. And on Matthew, he had the skin, the pelt, just the skin hanging off his arm. Matthew supposedly died by being skinned alive. Peter supposedly died on an X-shaped cross. But every apostle, they had, they had told a story about kind of the statue illustrated how they died. Only John, as far as we know, lived to an old age and died of old age. Whatever you consider old age, but John was the one considered a natural death. Every one of those guys were martyred. Every one of them. I want to talk about Job just a minute. You know, everybody talks about the patience of Job. And I think he's patient, but there's two kinds of patience in this world. There are the two patients that when something happens, and there's nothing wrong with this, we say, well, I'm going to pray, and it just happened, I just have to live with it. We all say that. Well, Job's patience was a little different because his situation was, he got mad. He was angry. And he said, his patience was absent. Was act little, I can't talk, excuse me. His patience was an active patience. He got upset and he was angry. And you know, if I was in his situation, I would be angry and, act and mad too. The thing I think Job did wrong wasn't that he questioned God, he challenged God. You don't challenge the Almighty. I don't think there's anything wrong in prayer if something bad happens to you and you're suffering for you to ask God why. If you do it in a humble and reverent manner, or if you say, God, what's going on? I need help. Can you explain this to me? Now I'm going to tell you something, and I don't take this long, and I'm not going to tell you the details, but I'm going to get kind of personal with you because I can empathize with Job. Since 2003, my mother, my father, my son, and my wife have all gone to heaven with God, every one of them, in 14 years. And I was angry. I got upset. I didn't challenge God, and I was reading the scriptures, trying to find answers. I just thank the Lord right now I didn't have three friends like Job. That's all I think, his three friends. I'm glad I didn't have them. But um, one night I was sitting on my couch, and I was reading my Bible, and I was having a pretty hard time. And I said, God, I need your help here. I'm suffering. I'm patient, but I need to be no, I just need to know why. And I was reading the book of John. God answered me. And here's what he said to me. Dale, my son died too. Dale, my son died too. And I let him die. 
You know why I let him die? So you can spend eternity with me. Now, you know, I got to thinking, here I am. All these family members have died. And I understand that death's part of life. But every time I started feeling sorry for myself or grieving a little bit, I thought of him. And I'm going to put a human quality on God. And please forgive me for this. How hard was it for God that day to sit in heaven and watch his son die? How hard was it for Mary to stand at the foot of that cross and watch her baby be crucified? Kind of puts it in a different perspective, doesn't it? So I said, okay, you've answered my prayers, and you didn't zap me. And I probably deserted. But God said to me, he said, and what Job, and the reason I'm saying that is here's what Job is really saying throughout the whole book. He's saying two things. And I think if you're honest with yourself, we do this. When we lose a loved one and we lose somebody close to us, and James is saying patience and perseverance and endurance and suffering, the two questions that will come up are these. It's number one, it's easy to, well, these aren't questions, excuse me, but it is easy to feel ignored and alone when you're really suffering. Number one. Number two, Job was asking this with all of his heart and his three friends that came up, they were ready to condemn him. All he was basically saying was, God, have you, do you remember me? Have you forgotten me? God, am I important to you anymore? And I think we ask God that in our own hearts. I think when we're suffering and we're in pain, and I think what these Christians were doing in the first century, in a practical manner, they were suffering, they were hurting financially. They were hurting. They asked God, and they were asking, do you still care? Do you remember me? And God answered me in a loving way through his scriptures. And he answered Job in a loving way, too, even though it's in a whirlwind. I love this. God comes in a whirlwind and said, who do you think you are? <laughs> because Job would challenge him. But in the end, what did God do? Well, God first told those three guys who'd come up to Job and told him he was wrong and all this and didn't show the true nature of God. He said, first thing y'all are going to do, you're going to get Job to pray for you. That's what he did in the morning. But he restored Job's family. He restored his wealth. He gave him everything. In fact, they said he had three of the most beautiful daughters in the whole country. But don't ever forget this. Although Job was, everything was restored to him, and I think Job's human. Job probably never forgot his first family. But he did not lose his faith. And that's what perseverance and suffering is all about, is that we do not give up our faith. And that's what James is saying. Don't get so discouraged. Don't get so discouraged by grief or suffering or everything else that you give up your faith and you just sit by yourself and you don't, you're not active in the church. You're not active in anything. Don't let grief, don't let suffering and all these things do this to you because you've got a God that loves you. And he'll take care of it. And on a, person, on a practical note, if you sit back and you're suffering and you're in grief, and you, you isolate yourself, you just let Satan win. He has taken you out of the game. You're nothing anymore. You're not an influence to anybody else. You're no good to yourself. And I don't want, I'm not trying to be cruel to anybody. There's times when we all have to do retrospects and, and do things, but I'm talking about the person that just gives up. Don't do that. And the reason I can say that is this. I know that God loves me, and I know God's a love Job. But I can look around this room and know there's people here. If something is really bothering me, if my faith is questioned, if I am really upset about something, there's people from that row all the way across this building, some of me I may just barely know you, that I can go to them and say, hey, man, would you pray for me? And they're there. Just on personal this morning, I had two guys pray for me. This morning, I come up and talk to them, ask them to say a prayer for me. And neither one of them know it. It just made my whole day. Just lifted up my whole day. But what James is saying, all through the suffering, the perseverance, and all the scripture, he's saying, don't give in. Persevere. 
Because if you persevere, look what's going to happen to you. You're going to be with God. You're going to be with the guy that gave his life for you. Can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven if you're, when we're in heaven to be able to look at Jesus and, and look at the man who gave his life for you? And this is another side note, and I'm going to go on. I always wondered after Jesus gave his life, you know, 50 days later, Peter preached the sermon at Pentecost where 3,000 souls were saved and baptized in Acts 2.38. I always wonder how many of that 3,000 were people 50 days before that stood in front of Pilate saying, crucify him. I'll guarantee you, I can't guarantee it, but I think there were some people there that probably accepted Christ that day, that 50 days before were yelling, crucify me. You see, Jesus just didn't die for one. He died for everybody. And now... I just want you to think about that. And the next time you read John 3.16, I want you to do me a favor. And I'll go on. Next time you read John 3.16, it's a very generic thing. God so loved the world. Take out the universal terms and put your name there. And read it two or three times and put your name personally there. And I think your attitude is good, but I think it'll, it'll give you a whole new perspective. Moving on. Verse 12. Above all, above all things, brother, or excuse me, above all things, brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes or your no be no. What James is talking about here, he's not talking about using bad words. And he's not talking about when you go to, to court and you say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, tell me God. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about, these, some of these guys, even though they were Christians, and there's been all one, some of them were around people that said, I swear by the sun that this is true. I swear by Zeus this is true. I swear by the stars this is true. I swear by this, this, that. That's what he's talking about. You know, if you have to use something like that to make your point, then your point's not going to be made anyway. Just say yes or no and go on about your business. And then if it wasn't isn't worth saying yes or no on, don't say it in the first place. I mean, it's pretty obvious. I'm not saying anything there that's not life-changing. I'm just saying, you know, and it goes right back into tie it back in practically. What does it go back to in James? Your tongue. We heard a wonderful lesson in here about speaking and what we say with our tongues, but it goes right back into that. Don't use your tongue unless you're going to use it in a proper manner. You know, so don't swear. I'm going to be real honest with you. Verse 13 through 16 and 17, I had some problems with some of this, but I've talked to several people, and I hope they've helped me with this. I didn't have problems understanding. I just had problems trying to explain it to myself. Let's look at verse 13, or excuse me. Yeah, verse 13, and going on down. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Anyone cheerful, let him sing psalms. Anyone among you sick, let him call on the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Okay, first, I think to go to the very first, it says if you're suffering, pray. Well, we're a praying church. I can guarantee you that. We are a praying church. And I'm going to say this, and if Tim, I think Tim will agree with me, over Tuesday morning in the seniors' class, sometimes we spend more time praying than we do having a lesson, don't we? And I don't think Tim minds that too much because I think he knows, and I think a lot of us know they're seniors. We know the more we pray, the more open our heart is and receptive to the Word of God because we've just spent about 20 or 30 minutes praying for other people and opening our hearts to God, and he's let us share that with our Father and then in return, we get to share his word back to us. So it just builds us. When you pray and you're hurting, you're talking to your dad. You're talking to your father. That's what Paul meant in the Bible when he says, Abba, Father. Because if it's translated in Latin, it's like saying, hey, dad. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but it's just like saying, hey, dad. I need some help here, you know. That's what he's saying. 
And we have a relationship with God when, when Christ died for us that we can be that kind of a son or a daughter. And we can have that kind of relationship. But when you open your heart in prayer, you're not only opening your heart to God, God's opening your heart to be receptive to Him. It's a two-way street. Now it says, if you're suffering, it says, the one that got me though, it says, let him call on the elders of the church and pray over him. Anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Anointing with oil was a custom that had went out through all the Jewish religion. And you got to understand, these people, and James tells us in chapter 1, verse 2, he said, to the 12 tribes that are dispersed. These were Jewish Christians he's writing to. Anointing with oil could be healing. They used it to heal. And they used it when pray. It was part of their tradition, so to speak. I don't think there's anything wrong. If somebody wanted to go to an elder here and say, I don't want to be anointed. I don't think it's unscriptural. It's just not part of our custom. And, you know, we, so we, I've never, I've only seen it done once. And it was on a man's deathbed. He asked one of the elders to do it, and they did it. But the thing is, I mean, I don't want anybody to misunderstand this. It says, let the elders pray for you, anointing with you on the name of the Lord. A prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Well, there's two things in this scripture. First, one of them is spiritual sickness. If you're suffering and grieving so bad that you're spiritually sick, get a righteous man or the elder of the church to pray for you. It'll lift you up. It will help you. That's what he's trying to tell you. And it's not the prayer of the person that's sick he's talking about. It's the prayers of the one that's praying for you. You know, if I'm sick, I can pray all day, and God may he answer my prayers. I'm not saying he won't. But if I get righteous people to pray for me and sincerely pray for me, God listens to them too. Now, that's what's on. Now, the physical part of being sick here, I don't want anybody to misunderstand this. A lot of times they'll say, well, I prayed for this person to get well, or I prayed for this person to, to not die, or I prayed for this or that. And it happened, so God didn't answer my prayers. That's not true. God answered your prayers. He'll, he'll answer them in a few ways. He may say yes, he may say no, or he say, may say later. But God answers our prayers. I have a saying, and it, may, it sounds kind of crazy. Man proposes, God disposes. We propose a lot of things, but only God is the one that takes care of everything in our lives. I know when my son was dying, he was in a coma, I was praying to God, please let him live. Well, he didn't. And I, I mean, he didn't do anything with God. My son, what I'm saying is my son died. And God had nothing to do with that. And I got thinking, well, if God would have brought him back, he'd had so many health problems. It would have created so much stress for my wife and me. God knew what he, you know, he knew. So God answered that prayer, my son's in heaven with him. I don't think, just because we don't get the answer that we want, doesn't mean that our prayers aren't answered. And I think we need to understand that. So many times in the world, people say, well, I can pray to God, and it's all going to get taken care of. It may get taken care of, but it will be taken care of maybe not the way you want it to be. But God is all-powerful. He can do... I'm not saying he's cruel. I, I get so tired of people painting a cruel picture of God like the Old Testament and praying. Even the Old Testament, God could be, it could get pretty bad sometime when he punished people, but they deserved it. But even then, he was a loving God. And I still think that's the same way. Um, when he says prayer, and, and he's just, you know, the prayers of a righteous man, you just cannot comprehend that. Until you pray, until you really let your heart come out of you, you can't comprehend that. I want to go back for just a minute. I thought this was pretty interesting. A singing church. A singing church. This church is a pretty good singing church. You guys are. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. David's my witness. I sit over there and make joyful noise to the Lord. You guys sing. And I told... Mr. Hayden back there one time, if you ever want to get out of church early, just let me lead singing one time. I guarantee if you let me lead singing one time, we won't have any preaching. You'll be gone. So I don't lead singing, thank goodness. 
But in all seriousness, we sing because we love God. We sing. It's part of our prayers to God in a way. We sing because we're joyous. We sing because we're happy. We do those things because we're happy. I wish everyone of you could hear Tuesday morning sometimes. Sometimes I just don't even sing Tuesday morning. I just listen to all the other people. We're all seniors in there, but you ought to hear that. They raise the roof off that place sometimes Tuesday morning. Jay comes in and leads a couple of songs, and it's just unbelievable. It's just inspiring just to sit and listen. Sometimes I just sit and listen to them sing because they're pouring out. You can see the joy on their face. We sing because we're joyous. We don't sing because we have to. We don't sing because we're forced to. We sing because we want to. It's, it's the same reason I come to church. God commands me to be here when the doors open. I understand that. I don't come to church because I have to. I come to church because I want to. I come to church because I know I can come to church because I'm going to get prayer with other Christians. I know I'm going to grow from being around you and you and you and you and you. And I know I'm going to get encouraged. I know that. And that makes me want to sing sometimes in my own mind. It just, it's just the joy of doing it. Going back down, I missed that. That's why I went back to it. But let's go on down here, says. Confess your trespasses. Oh, wait a minute. I want to make a point. I don't want to miss this. If I miss this, I'm wrong. There's two things that I like about this church more than anything. I've already mentioned the Tuesday class about the praying and the teaching and the singing. You know what the best thing on Sunday night is for me and Sundays? Anthony in here. So I love the preaching. I love the singing. But you know what the most inspiring thing is on Sunday for me sometimes? It's Sunday night listening to one of them little old young guys over there praying. Listening to one of them little ones praying. There's no telling what sometimes they'll say. But every time they'll say it, it'll be from the heart. I heard one of them one Sunday say this. Dear God, help the sick. And he went through it a little bit and he says, and God, help my grandpa's feet to get well. I just thought, you know, how wonderful that you can have that kind of heart and God responds to that. that. That to me, that's one of the most uplifting things in church, hearing those little kids pray every Sunday night. Now, going on. I didn't want to leave that out. I'm sorry. It says, confess one another. Confess your sins to one another and build each other up. It says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's talking about, I think really, I may be wrong, but I think it's talking about spiritual healing. Does that mean I'm going to go around and tell you everything I've done wrong in my life? No. But I may come up to Tim or Purcell or Darwin or David or Jose or somebody and say, Hey, man, I've been having a problem. I just can't focus. I'm, I'm having problems. Would you pray with me? You know, it's, you don't. And just asking somebody to pray with you because you've opened your heart to them and you've given them a chance to open their heart to you. And they grow from that from prayer and you grow from that from prayer. And both of you have just gotten closer to God. James, every practical thing in this book that he tells us, from everything he tells us here, is centered around prayer. Whether it's your tongue or seeking wisdom or suffering or patience, everything deals, when it comes down to these few last verses, about prayer. Prayer is the focus, you know, we talk about everything in this book, but prayer is the focus of this book, even though James gives us a lot of ethics. I remember James Olson a few weeks ago was talking about partiality. I believe James was. And he did a wonderful job. But even when James was telling us, and I'm talking about James, James here, when he was telling us about partiality, not to be partial, he said something about prayer. Controlling your tongue, Pray. Pray, 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 pray. That's what this book's about. You know, it's, it's about getting closer to God. That's what James is trying to tell these people. You're having trouble. You're suffering. You're, you're hurting. Pray. And if you, you pray to God and then find your brothers and sisters and pray with them. That's what he's telling people. He says, pray. When someone confesses a sin to you and if they've done something wrong and they really do confess a sin to you, it's real important that you listen. And everything. Last statement. Boy, I didn't get through here. Yeah, I did. <laughs> the last thing it says when you bring a brother back. I hope if you go to a brother 
and they're in sin. And if I've done something wrong and somebody comes to me, I hope that we approach them in love and understanding and in prayer. And I hope that we do it in a way, and we're not like Job's three friends condemning him. We don't need to condemn people when they come to us and we know they've sinned. They know what they've done wrong. And sometimes you talk about it and you talk about the problems and they may want to confess it and you sit down and talk with them. But I honestly think the way you're going to get a person, a brother or sister, to come back to the church and come back to God is to love them. I always remember Jesus and the woman at the well. I mean, not the woman at the well, but when he was writing in the dirt and he said, let he who is sinless throw the first stone. I think James has told us in this series all the ethnic things, but he has told us to love each other and to pray together. I asked, I'm going to ask Jay to do something now. I don't want to end this with a song. And because this song really sets the tone for the end of James. And Jay agreed to do it. And if y'all will sing with me and really pay attention to the course of this song, I appreciate your time. Thank you.